Okay, it's uh, 3.01 when I uh, said we would start. So uh, I'm Mike Douglas, and this is the New Technologies in Mathematics seminar series of the CMSA. And we're delighted today to have Jeffrey Pennington from Google Brain, who will be telling us about uh, triple descent as work in the theory of uh, machine learning. Uh, Jeffrey has uh, many, many uh, significant uh, contributions, such as the uh, glove uh, word embedding model, many works in theory of machine uh, learning, uh, topics that uh, bridge uh, theoretical physics. He started out uh, there and uh, machine learning. And uh, so we're delighted to have him with us, uh, Jeffrey. Great, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, for the invitation and thanks everybody for, for tuning in. I'm, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to tell you about some of the things I've been thinking about over the last year or so related to um, the theory of deep learning and basically why do these deep neural nets work? Um, so I should mention at the forefront that this has been a fairly long and, and technical endeavor uh, that's involved some, I think, quite interesting mathematics from random matrix theory, particularly from uh, the theory of operator valued free probability. Um, and these tools have allowed us to drive some pretty cool results. And so I was a bit torn today deciding whether to focus more on the tools or more on the results. and. Um, I decided today to tell you about mostly the results, and I, I hope they will at least be inspiring and uh, interesting enough that some of you might decide to dig into some of the underlying math um, that, that made this all possible. So, um, <clears throat> um, so to begin with some background, let me just start at the at the highest possible level. So everybody's definitely on the same page. I'm going to be talking about supervised learning. And of course, everybody knows what supervised learning is. But just to give you uh, my perspective here. So the idea is you you want to provide some machine with your data set, which you probably painstakingly hand labeled. And you'd like to be able to feed in uh, to your machine some new data that you have not labeled and have it hopefully accurately produce some predictions for you. And the goal of supervised learning, of course, is how do you actually achieve this? How do you train the machine? And you do this by on the standard way, I think, um, although perhaps there are other esoteric methods I'm unaware of. It's, you formalize the problem by sort of um, uh, taking your labels, calling them some vector in, in Rn, your, your training data, you take the RGB values of your image, for example, and, and put them into some giant train matrix. You, you parameterize a space of hypotheses, um, usually with some vector of parameters theta, and you, you make some predictions, um, y hat, that depend on your hypothesis, and of course, the underlying data. And the strategy of supervised learning is, is to introduce that, that um, uh, penalizes the distance between your predictions y hat and the ground truth y. And the goal is to find some uh, minimizer within your hypothesis class, which, which hopefully minimizes this loss. And <clears throat> I'll be talking about squared error today. Of course, there are many choices. Um, and I think a particular note in sort of the discussion of modern machine learning is the class of hypotheses that seems to be working very well, namely uh, deep neural nets. So what's a deep neural net? Of course, modern architectures are much more sophisticated than what I'm illustrating here. But for the sake of analysis, let me just define this fully connected deep forward neural net, which takes your input x, passes it successively through a sequence of um, affine transformation followed by element-wise nonlinear function applications, resulting in a sequence of intermediate hidden layers, x1 through xl, and finally producing some output, y hat. And um, <clears throat> um, the, the model 
H depends on some set of parameters theta. And this is your deep, your deep neural net. And just for reference going forward, I'll refer to the, the number of hidden units in each layer is n sub L, the total number of parameters as P. I'm typically not gonna talk about any biases that complicates the already complicated story. And the number of samples I'll refer to as M. And so this is uh, sort of a sketch of what the hypothesis class looks like for deep learning. Um, and I think the main, or one of the main outstanding and important questions in the field right now is just why does this work? And this is an, I think an interesting question precisely because sort of your prior expectations as a maybe statistical learning theorist would be that it should, should fail miserably. Um, and the reason for that expectation is that deep neural nets define a very, very flexible and expressive class of functions. And I think the, the intuition is that it's too expressive. Um, to give you some idea about this, here's a figure of showing the uh, size of various image classification models. This is potentially a bit outdated now, but these models contain you know, hundreds of millions of parameters. More recently, some of the um, large language generation models have uh, hundreds of billions of parameters now. <coughs> these things are just huge. And it's not just that they have a lot of parameters that are redundant, um, which is a possibility, I suppose. It, the models themselves are, in fact, extremely expressive. And I think sort of the first paper that made this quantitative in a compelling way from 2017 showed that if you take a, a good, a well performed I mean, a good model uh, on some image classification task, you find that um, you're easily able to, to minimize the training loss <coughs> here in blue. But if you take that same model and perturb the data by, for example, randomly relabeling the images, shuffling the pixels, um, putting in random data for the pixels, completely random data altogether, for all of these, um, problems with no structure or limited structure, the same model still manages to minimize the training loss, uh, which suggests that this huge class of kind of random <laughs> label assignment functions that are enormously complex live within your hypothesis space and you're easily able to find them. So how is it that you find the models that generalize well uh, from this large hypothesis class, which contains things that obviously are uh, a poor model for the underlying generative process. Um, to say this another way, um, you know, you expect these models to overfit. Namely, you expect the training, if you see the training error going to zero, um, that, that the Tesla error should, should remain large uh, or, or grow, uh, grow large. And of course, the standard picture for this is, is maybe illustrated by this sort of 1D example. If your hypothesis class is too restricted, then perhaps you're only able to model uh, linear functions of the data. You can't capture the underlying structure. You're in the underfitting regime. But if your class of hypotheses is too large, you can easily fit all the training points, but you do so um, at the expense of, of producing an overly complicated function uh, that, that makes egregious mistakes away from the training points. And you're in the overfitting regime. Uh, this picture is reflected in sort of the standard U-shaped curve that you might find in classical textbook on the subject where this is as you increase the uh, model complexity, uh, but the test loss, well, at first decreases, um, moving from underfitting to the overfitting regime and eventually increases. There's some optimal model complexity, at least that's how the standard argument goes. Um, but deep neural nets clearly live way off to the right in this figure. And the question is, why do they perform well? Um, another perspective on this U-shaped curve is through the uh, bias variance decomposition. And um, I'll come back to this in detail later, but to give just an introduction on the topic, the idea is you, for squared error, you can take a, a particular test point and decompose the per sample loss um, just by manipulating the terms. 
into three pieces, one of which um, if you average over the test points, you might interpret as the bias term because it tells you basically um, on average, what do the predictive functions in your hypothesis class um, that are conditioned to match the training points, on average, how do they perform uh, relative to the test set? And you expect the bias to decrease as you increase the model complexity because you're making fewer and fewer erroneous assumptions about the underlying structure of the data. Um, as your model complexity grows, um, you're imposing fewer and fewer prior assumptions about what you expect the model to look like. And so the bias you expect to decrease, uh, the variance though you expect to increase as the model complexity increases because it's basically measuring, you know, um, some, some measure of spread of the functions in your hypothesis class, <coughs> which fit the training data. As your class gets bigger, you know, there's more options to explore. And I think the intuition is you essentially expect this to grow large. And then also there's a noise term, um, but I'm gonna just more or less forget this for today. It is independent of your predictive function and just is some intrinsic irreducible error. Um, so anyway, uh, there's a sort of a trade-off between bias and variance. At least you'll find a picture like this in the standard textbook. Um, and, and somewhere around the middle is the optimal model complexity. But again, the, the experimental evidence seems to suggest at least that for neural nets, the model complexity is huge. So why isn't the test error really high? Because you live way off to the right. Um, indeed, some of the evidence uh, that has been accruing over the last few years exploring these ideas show that when the number of parameters is small, i.e. small relative to the number of constraints, the number of samples, for example, um, then you do exhibit this kind of classical U-shaped curve where the training error descends and goes to zero or becomes small. And in that regime, you see the U-shaped curve in the test error. But past the interpolation threshold, the test error decreases again. And this has been observed in many contexts now. And there's sort of a paradigm for understanding this behavior is by the name of double descent. So this sort of classical picture needs to get extended somehow um, and, and extended in a way that, that captures this double descent behavior. So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to uh, provide a model that I think captures all the relevant phenomenology of double descent, but that we can solve analytically and gain insight into exactly what is causing this peak in the test error. And I'm going to attribute the cause to particular components in the variance, which I'll reveal through a novel and, and fine-grained uh, extension of the bias variance decomposition. But you could also ask what happens as the number of parameters it's even larger, uh, and you move off to the right. Does the test error just keep going down? Does it go back up? What happens? Half of this talk, I'm going to describe um, a, uh, a phenomenon that I'll call triple descent. Uh, but, but in general, I think the idea is that there can be complicated, uh, non-trivial behavior that happens deep in the overparameterized regime. And I'll describe through um, high-dimensional analysis of the neural tangent kernel, how one can uh, predict and observe non-monotonicity near the, what we call the quadratic scaling regime, where the number of parameters is uh, quadratic in the data set size. So that's sort of the outline of what I'll talk about. And let me begin by setting up the problem and, and maybe some motivation for, for, for why uh, I think this problem is is a good way to, to gain insight into these phenomena. So, um, I think in this, 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 the statistics literature, the most common and, and simplest type of model to analyze is linear regression. And linear regression can reveal um, surprisingly complex phenomena, especially in, in high dimensions, um, which is a regime that I'll be focusing on which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but <clears throat> it turns out, and this is maybe why the phenomenon has gone 
been recognized for so long, um, double descent can't really be adequately modeled by linear regression. And the reason is just, and there's maybe some caveats to this statement, but the basic reason is that the data dimensionality um, is equal to the number of parameters in the model. So it's, it's not really possible to increase the model capacity uh, without simultaneously changing the data distribution. Um, but in order to model double descent, what you want to do is fix the problem, fix the data distribution, and change the, the size and complexity of your model and see what happens. And you, you really can't do this with, with linear regression. <coughs> so in search of um, sort of the simplest model that does allow you to do this, I, I mean, I think that probably the simplest, the simplest model that allows this is, is random feature kernel regression. And this is actually very simple because it's just linear regression, but instead of regressing on, on the data matrix X, you first pass the matrix through uh, a single hidden layer of the neural net. Namely, you apply some random matrix of weights, W1, then you apply element-wise to that matrix uh, some nonlinear function. And then you just uh, do linear regression on that object. And yeah, as I mentioned, this, is, this, this can be interpreted as the first uh, post-activation matrix of a, uh, a neural network at initialization. And, and um, the entries of W1, for example, could be drawn from a standard normal distribution. And crucially, this um, rectangularity, the shape parameter N1, the width of the, of the hidden layer or the number of random features is independent of the data distribution. So you can adjust that at will and vary the complexity of the model. So I should mention another nice uh, property of random feature kernel regression is that while the model is linear in the parameters, it's nonlinear in the data. So, so you can actually model nonlinear dependencies, uh, which makes for a much more expressive class of model. Uh, further motivation for studying this setup is that it's equivalent to training the uh, top layer of a single hidden layer neural net. So you optimize only the top layer with whatever optimizer, it's convex, so gradient descent, you will find the uh, solution to this kernel regression problem. And actually the main reason I think for looking at this in the context of understanding double descent at least, is that for simple data distribution, one can compute the test error um, analytically, um, at least in, in high dimensional asymptotics that I'll describe in a second. <coughs> So there are many generalizations to this data distribution um, that I'll be focusing on, which are also trackable. But, but um, just think of the data being IID Gaussian and the, the labels being generated by a linear model um, plus some noise. And it turns out <coughs> that you can solve this analytically. Um, and one of the simplifications that allows you to solve it is is um, the high dimensional asymptotics. Uh, but uh, I just want to spend a minute motivating these asymptotics in their own right, because um, I actually think this is a somewhat underappreciated property of, of modern machine learning models. Um, I mentioned before that deep learning models have a lot of parameters. But what does a lot really mean? Um, you have to quantify the number relative to the other scales in the problem, uh, which may be, I think most relevantly, the number of samples, the number of constraints you're trying to fit. Um, and I would like to argue that, that by and large, most practically successful uh, deep learning models live somewhere between a, a quadratic over parameterization and a linear over-parameterization regime, where in the former case, the number of parameter scales, like the data set size squared, and in the uh, linear case, as the data set size. Um, 
In the quadratic overparameterization setting, at least for fully connected models, um, you could think of the intermediate hidden layer width n as being proportional to the data set size. And since the parameters are kind of quadratic in the width, then you get p proportional to m squared. Um, but if you look at just a few examples, and there are many ways you could break this, but, but I think by and large, this is roughly the case where p lives somewhere between m and m squared. And precisely where it lives is going to depend on lots of factors. But, but basically, um, if you can understand these two regimes, I think you're in a good spot for understanding the, um, the, the kind of high dimensionality that's relevant for, for deep learning models. So um, for our theoretical analysis motivated by, by that, we're, we're going to focus the high dimensional kind of joint asymptotics where the data set size, the input dimensionality, and the hidden layer sides all go to infinity, and they're going to go to infinity at the same rate. And this is nice from the theoretical perspective for a number of reasons, but from the practical perspective, it's nice also because um, it allows you to access, in fact, both of these uh, linear and quadratic scaling uh, over parameterization regimes. And you can do so by studying different random feature models. So, for the random feature model I just mentioned, where the random features are, are this matrix F, i.e. the output of the first uh, post-activation hidden layer of a random neural net, uh, the number of parameters in that model is actually just equal to the width. You have a linear readout on top of those random features. And then these joint asymptotics here in the linear over parameterization regime. Um, and, but as I'll come back to later on, one can also consider the uh, neural tangent kernel random features, which are generated by the uh, Jacobian of the model. So you, uh, the microphone is on here. Okay, please, uh, whoever whoever it is, uh, you know, watch for that. Uh, I think you can continue the effort. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, so, 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 let me just repeat. So, for the random feature model I just described, uh, where the random features are are this matrix F, you're in the linear over parameterization regime. Um, but you can also consider, and as I'll discuss later, the neural tangent kernel features, which are generated by the Jacobian of the model with respect to its parameters, and um, therefore the the, the number of random features in that setting is equal to the number of weights in the model, which is roughly n0 times n1, i.e. a p is in, in, in this joint scaling limit quadratic in the number of data points. So by changing the kernel you look at, this joint asymptotic let you probe both uh, over parameterization regimes. And just as an aside, for those of you who if you don't think much about high dimensional asymptotics, I just wanted to give uh, a very quick piece of intuition about how non-trivial behavior can crop up in this setting. So by way of contrast, if you think about the standard sort of low dimensional regime, where the number of features is finite, but the number of samples you draw tends to infinity, uh, if your data set is built out of IID Gaussian entries, for example, the, um, the covariance approaches the identity. But in, in the kind of high dimensional regime we're talking about, where N0 and N both diverge at the same rate, then in fact, the spectrum of the covariance approaches some non-trivial density it's called the marchenko petscher density. And this kind of non-triviality that emerges in high dimensions is reflected, I think, in the, the nuance and intricacy of the, um, of the resulting test error curves. And, and somehow, uh, I think basically the, the existence of these sort of non-trivial limits makes it possible to, to examine double descent and beyond, even when your data set itself is 
uh, relatively simple. So I think this is one reason why we can get away with, at least as a first pass, looking at these uh, very simple data sets. So, <coughs> um, as I mentioned, uh, um, unfortunately, I probably won't have time, although if things go quickly, maybe at the end, I can come back to some of the details for how these calculations go. But here I just put forward some uh, kind of teaser plots, emphasizing the fact that we have an analytical expression for the test error in this kernel random feature regression case for these simple data sets in the high dimensional asymptotics, and that the results show um, all of the behavior that one might hope to capture regarding double descent. So here are the plots on the y-axis is the error dotted lines, training followed lines test. The x-axis is the number of random features and one divided by the data set size. So this dimensionless quantity measures how much over parameterization there is. And when N1 equals M, you're at the interpolation threshold and you see a divergence in the test error happening when the regularization constant gamma is small, i.e. the blue curve. So, um, so we have this model, analytical model for double descent. And what I would like to do um, is try to pick it apart to understand where the um, peak is coming from. So I, um, I won't have time to describe these results at all. There's probably not too much point in flashing this theorem, but I just wanted to point out, <coughs> for those of you who are familiar with these kinds of settings, that you know, the results are expressible in terms of these um, Stilch's transform type objects, traces of the resolvent of the kernel matrix um, and, and related uh, uh, quantities with some factors in the numerator, tau2. Um, and these objects, as is sort of standard in random matrix theory, end up satisfying some polynomial equations. You select the right root, and the training and test error can be expressed in terms of those roots. <coughs> um, one thing that I have yet to understand, uh, so I'd like to highlight in case anybody has some insight, uh, very surprisingly and completely unexpectedly from the details of the calculation, the test error ends up basically being proportional to the training error with some factor that is the square of uh, the resolvent in the denominator. Um, so this is related to some generalized uh, cross-validation metrics in, that have cropped up in the 80s. In fact, it's exactly that, but the origin of this relationship remains mysterious to me. So I thought I would highlight it. Um, but that's all I'm gonna say, I think about these details because I really wanna focus on the bias variance decomposition and what's causing double descent. Uh, I mentioned that the bias variance decomposition can be viewed uh, first and foremost as a per sample decomposition, uh, which is just a pure algebraic manipulation. Um, but I was deliberately vague in this equation about what I meant by these expectations. I kind of alluded to the fact that um, I'm trying to measure something about the distribution in the class of hypotheses, but what exactly is this expectation over? And if you look in the um, standard textbook definitions of the bias variance competition, uh, decomposition, what you find, I think, are <laughs> basically models for which there's one uh, source of noise, and it's usually additive label noise. And, um, and that's the only thing that is, that is um, predictive function. And so the bias variance decomposition can unambiguously be expressed uh, by interpreting these expectations as expectations over this label noise. So this is the classical standard decomposition. Um, and I think this has served quite useful 
for building intuition and building models, but I don't think it, it really helps us understand double descent. And the reason is that the models that we're talking about here actually have additional sources of randomness. Uh, randomness uh, from the... I, I just was asking, I want to ask, I mean, I mean, I, I, I thought the, the usual noise people talk about is a sampling noise, you know, there's some underlying distribution and there's the empirical distribution. I mean, is that what you mean or is or so there's different, yes. So there's different ways of modeling the sample noise. And one way of modeling it is sampling of the labels. And so which, um, when you sample the labels, you might assume that there's some uh, uh, noise in the measurement process on the label side. Of course, yeah, there's also um, um, sample noise in drawing the data X. Yeah. But, but what I, and in which case you could just replace epsilon by X in this equation. And I think what I am saying is still valid. Mm -hmm. My point is going to be that we have additional sources of randomness that, um, that are from the random parameters generating the features W1, right. uh, X itself sampling noise and label noise. And the point is that there are multi, multiple variables involved. Uh, and this will be the, the crucial point. Um, so, um, I would like to, to just mention a few of the approaches that people have taken in the literature to dealing with this kind of multivariate uh, random variable perspective on the bias variance decomposition. Um, and I think, uh, and what maybe the first approach in this direction, um, we call the semi-classical approach because the idea is basically you, you, you forget about these other random variables. So in this approach, you, you condition on theta and then compute the classical decomposition. Um, and at the end, you can average over theta. And I mean, this is a mathematically well-defined thing to do. Um, and I think it's motivated by the fact that for these kinds of problems in, in this high dimensional setup, actually the subsequent expectation over theta ends up being unnecessary because things concentrate about their mean. So if you remove these expectations over theta, in fact, you have exactly the, the classical decomposition, but everything is just conditional on theta. So you kind of just forget about these random variables altogether. And I think this is a, from that perspective, is a reasonably well-motivated thing to try. And in fact, using our analytical model, we can, we can do that and look at what you find. And what you find is, um, uh, again, so this is a plot where on the x-axis you have the over-parameterization ratio, the test error on the y-axis, the sum of the variance in pink and the bias in gray is the total error, not plotted. But the point is that there's um, a divergence at the interpolation threshold in both the bias and the variance. Um, and so this was the approach taken by May and Montanari, one of the first calculations that looked at these random feature models. And they, they kind of basically said this bias divergence was a kind of curiosity. <laughs> um, but I, I guess my perspective is that if one would like to interpret the bias as a measure of the erroneous assumptions in the model, then one should expect as the model complexity increases for the bias to, to at least, I mean, to decrease if, or stay the same, um, but definitely not to increase and not diverge. And so I think this uh, observation of, of the bias diverging is reflecting <coughs> basically um, uh, an improper labeling of the bias and variance in this case. And it's improper because, because you've sort of neglected to consider these extra random variables, theta. And I'm not, we're not the first people to think about this. Um, and there have been some efforts to study multivariate bias variance decomposition. And, and I think um, neglecting this analysis from May and Montanari, probably the thing one would, would do naively would be to include all the random variables in these expectations, to treat everything as a first class citizen, 
and regard epsilon and theta and everything as uh, um, as the random variables over which you're you're computing this become uh, these expectations. And I think this is a sensible thing to do. Also, uh, the issue that arises is how you interpret the variance term, because it includes contributions from multiple sources of randomness. And you'd probably like to attribute those sources of randomness to 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 features in in, in the variance. Uh, behavior that you might observe. So um, I think the approach that has been taken in the literature has been to decompose the variance itself um, using the law of total variance. So if you have uh, multiple random variables, you can decompose the total variance uh, by this law of total variance or use law. Um, and, but the application or, of this decomposition or the particular decomposition into two additive terms uh, actually depends on which variable you decide to condition on. So you could um, condition on, for example, the randomness in sampling the data, or you could condition on randomness in sampling the parameters. And you actually get two different decompositions. Um, so let me just dig into that briefly. So uh, in 2018, Neil et al., uh, from the empirical perspective, tried to investigate the decomposition of the variance using this law of total variance by partitioning the uh, random variables into a, a set of data. In our case, this would be X and epsilon and, and parameters. And because um, in this decomposition through law of total variance, the first term has variance over the data. They attribute that term to, uh, to variance due to sampling. And the remainder is uh, variance due to optimization or the parameters. Um, so again, we can use our analytical results to, to decompose the test error into these two ways. And we can plot the results. And indeed, you find now that you've um, now that you've regarded the random variables to consist not just of epsilon, but of epsilon and theta, or in this case, uh, D and P, that the bias is now monotonic, it's decreasing. Uh, furthermore, you observe that the uh, variance due to sampling is finite. And so the interpretation that you would draw from this approach and the one that Neil et al. drew is that the divergence is coming um, from optimization. So the peak's coming from the, the choice of the initial parameters and the variance that's associated with, with sampling them. Um, but what they didn't do, although I think is an equally valid thing to try, would be to uh, condition instead of on D, the condition on the parameters P when applying the law of total variance. And following the same intuitions, one could label V sub P is now the variance due to optimization. And the other term is the one due to sampling. And again, you can uh, plot this, but now you find that the divergence is due to sampling, i.e. the choice of the training data. And so I think you find yourself in this undesirable position where the interpretation of the divergence depends on the order in which you condition on the random variables. And, and, uh, this struck us as is suboptimal. So uh, if you're thinking about this, we realize that, that in fact there's a unique way to resolve this ambiguity by symmetrically decomposing the variance. Um, and, and okay, rather than focusing on the details here, all these definitions, we focus on a couple examples. So let's focus again on this two variable case with parameters and data. Um, our, our decomposition defines three terms. You have the variance that's explained by the parameters, VP, the variance explained by the data, VD, and then you have this VPD term, um, which is basically what's left. And it's the variance that's explained by the parameters and the data jointly, uh, that's sort of beyond what's explained by either of them individually. And so this uh, 
variance expectation operator is 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 uh, a super additive function. You can use that property to show that all these terms are positive. Uh, so you can um, um, interpret these guys as as areas, and and so you can do this in the three variable case with px and epsilon. The same intuition applies. I think it's easiest to understand in terms of a, a Venn diagram. So in the three variable case, you decompose the variance in this symmetrical way. And I think the way you should think about these B sub S terms is that, you know, V sub S is kind of like the variance that's explained by S that's not explained by any subset of S. Uh, so um, hopefully that is clear from the Venn diagram. Um, what, what, what one can do now though is uh, take this decomposition, which um, one can apply to our, our asymptotic results for the test error to obtain explicit formulas for each of these eight uh, variance components and as well as the bias. Um, and, and then try to interpret some of these prior decompositions in this new light. So um, hopefully this isn't too small uh, and there's a lot of detail going on here, but if you, um, if you, if you look at panel uh, E where we've done the full trivariate decomposition, the divergent terms are highlighted in a dashed red line in VPX and VPX epsilon. And then I pulled that dashed line back into the Venn diagrams corresponding to other variance decompositions to show which components of the, uh, of the terms are divergent. So in the semi-classical decomposition, you see that both the bias and the variance have this divergence and in the law of total variance, depending on which way you condition on the variant of variables, you know, one or the other term seems to encompass everything. Um, but so, so the point I think is that maybe simplest to see in the bivariate case in panel D, where VPD contains all of the divergence. And so, uh, and so the conclusion I think would be that the variance that's explained by the parameters and the data together beyond what either of them explain individually is in fact the source of the divergence. And unfortunately, it's a bit of a mouthful, but I think one benefit of this fine-grained decomposition is we have the kind of atomic units and from them, we can piece together any interpretation you want and understand its origin and really uh, what's happening. And one upshot from this analysis that could potentially be of practical interest um, is that because VPD is the source of the divergence, uh, the prediction would be that if you ensemble over the parameters or if you ensemble over different samples of the training data set, you'll eliminate the divergence entirely, either one. And so in fact, we see this empirically. So here's some theory curves and on top of some empirical observations, dots for finite models. And if you average over KP different models with the same data on the left, you do that an infinite number of times in black, the peak at, at the interpolation threshold vanishes. Likewise, if you ensemble over different draws of the training data set. So, um, yeah, all told, I mean, we have this sort of fine-grained bias variance decomposition, which gives us really, uh, I think, as detailed of insight into what's happening as could be could be done. And although the explanation is is requires some nuance, I think to to put forward, I think it does resolve the question about where this divergence is is coming from. So let me just pause there for one second and. Before I spend another 10 minutes or something uh, talking about what happens beyond double descent, in case anybody has some questions. Um, questions? Yeah, I, I, I think this is quite intriguing. So, 
so in some sense, it's the, the, the combination of the two sources of randomness is, is, is what you're saying that, that leads to the peak. And uh, I mean, it's, uh, I mean it, that, that, that seems like a new observation to me. It seems different from what, what many other people have said. So I can make one other nuanced comment, which is that there's been some discussion, uh, I think, in the literature about whether or not label noise is or is not the cause of double descent. And the trivariate decomposition here reveals that. Um, um, one sees that both VPX and VPX epsilon are divergent. And so um, even if you eliminated the label noise, which would set VPX epsilon to zero, you'd still have a divergent term uh, from VPX. So, so while label noise, so this basically says label noise does not cause the divergence, but it can exacerbate it. Does it make sense to, to ask a, an even sharper question that, you know, for, for in, in this uh, joint space of uh, sampling and, 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 and parameter or parameter initialization that there are particular regions or particular directions that, that cause these divergences? Is that a uh, sensible question or? Hello? Is your phone? Uh... Hey, Mike, I think his, uh, his uh, um, voice got- yeah, It looks like he, he, he's, he's having trouble with his phone. He had to, he had to use the phone to uh, do the, uh, you know, are you back, Jeffrey? I don't think he's back. No, apparently not. I mean, uh, so he, he's been using, you know, the uh, slides on his computer and the voice on the uh, phone. So perhaps he's uh, calling back in. Uh, yeah, sorry, my audio cut out, he, he says on the chat. So, uh, okay, I guess we'll uh, wait for that. Okay, very sorry about that. Okay, so this is not the computer not, working? Yeah, sorry, I'm connected by my phone and I don't, also don't have great phone signal here, but okay, sorry about that. I need to be back on. Um, let me move on uh, and in, the, in probably hopefully five, five plus minutes talk a little bit about what can happen beyond double descent. So as I mentioned before, uh, one can access the uh, quadratically over-parameterized regime by moving from the standard random feature kernel that we were discussing to, to analyzing the neural tangent kernel. And this is interesting, not just uh, because it enables us to access this new regime of over-parameterization, but of course, because the neural tangent kernel corresponds to uh, the behavior of, of neural networks that are optimized under gradient descent as the width goes to infinity. So uh, concretely, previously we were looking at the case where we, as I mentioned, optimize only the top layer weights of a two-layer uh, two network, uh, W2. Uh, now I'll be curious to know what happens when you optimize both layers. And since I'm sure many of you are familiar with the NTK, uh, I'll just give some brief intuition, which is, you know, that as the width gets large, the parameters themselves individually move less and less during the course of, of gradient descent, which means that the parameter vector theta lives close to its initial value, which itself motivates doing a linear approximation of the predictive function at time t around the predictions at time zero, plus a first order correction. And in many cases, as the width goes to infinity, this linear approximation becomes exact. And as a first order linear differential equation, you can uh, 
solve uh, the dynamics exactly, and they're characterized by what's called the neural tangent kernel. And because the neural tangent kernel is built out of this Jacobian J, which is the Jacobian of the network with respect to the weights in it, uh, W1 and W2, it naturally decomposes into two additive pieces that come from the first layer and the second layer uh, weights. And this term theta two from the second layer weights is precisely the random feature kernel we looked at previously. And uh, the difference with the NTK relative to that is there's the addition of this first layer kernel, which itself has a lot more structure, including this Hadamard product. Um, so uh, this, this linear model contains the offset constant term N zero. Um, this isn't a major point, but you can just remove this kind of artificially by subtracting out the uh, predictions at time zero from the prediction at time t. And this is useful because it kind of removes some unnecessary variance in the model. Um, call this variance reduction or centering. So the NTK consists of uh, these two kernels, theta two, which is, is the random feature kernel from before, and theta one, which has this non-trivial structure. And all I want to say about this here is that it turns out in the high dimensional asymptotics we're considering, the uh, structure of theta one actually simplifies. The off diagonal entries in the first left hand term of the Hadamard product actually um, 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 have some non zero mean typically and plus some fluctuations about that mean. And the fluctuations just end up being too small to matter. Um, so uh, basically theta one is equivalent to this simple identity plus X transpose X. <clears throat> I would like to point out though, if one could understand the regime in which N zero times N one is proportional to M, this would suggest that the, these fluctuations actually matter, um, but we don't know how to solve this random matrix problem. So this is an open problem, which I think would be quite nice to solve if anybody has the, the insights to do so. Okay, so this is just to say we have an analytic expression, um, which I'd like to show just by plotting things. So here's the second layer kernel, i.e. the random feature kernel from where there's a, a, a peak showing the double descent. On top of that, one can overlay the NTK. And you see that actually the test error grows as the overparameterization becomes larger, which is um, probably quite counterintuitive. The main reason for this is because of this uh, offset and zero that I mentioned that contributes some unnecessary variance. If you subtract that, you actually find that the test error decreases again. Uh, but there's this hump that remained. And so furthermore, plotting these sets of curves on top of one another is maybe not the right thing to do. Um, while it's correct to plot N1 over M, I think we're more interested probably in plotting things uh, in terms of the total number of parameters. And um, as I mentioned, for the NTK, the total number of parameters, since it relates to the total number of weights, is like N0 times N1. Whereas from the random feature kernel, it it only cares about the size of the hidden layer, so it's just N1. So if you change the axis to the number of parameters, one expects to see some curve kind of like this. Um, now I should emphasize that here we're piecing together two separate calculations, one for the random feature kernel on the left, one from the NTK on the right. And because we don't have access or knowledge about how to do this, calculation for the linear over parameterized scaling limit for the NTK, we don't necessarily have a complete picture that spans both of these regimes. So this is a kind of a conjecture. Um, however, we can verify it empirically. So on the left is um, changing the, the width of a, a kernel regression model with the NTK. And this does span within a single model both the linear and quadratic regimes, and you see empirically the triple descent phenomenon emerging. And in the quadratic regime near the second hump, the 
theoretical predictions match very well as dotted lines there. Turns out that the global minimum doesn't need to be at infinity. So you can be too over parameterized, especially if there's significant noise in the labels. And finally, I just mentioned that, um, that while the NTK is known to describe the gradient descent dynamics of wide neural networks, again, the width must be in comparison to other scales in the problem, particularly the number of samples. And in our case, since we've taken the width and the number of samples to be proportional, in fact, the NTK is not constant and does not describe gradient descent dynamics exactly. So you could ask what happens if you actually simulate gradient dynamics and compare them to the neural tangent kernel uh, regression dynamics. And the test error of the two is plotted in the right panel, with blue being the kernel and red being gradient descent. And while they differ in detail, they agree in terms of the qualitative structure. So for this reason, uh, we sort of conjecture that, that there may exist this kind of picture where there is uh, triple descent, or at least non-trivial behavior near the quadratic scaling regime, and uh, that it's likely, to a large extent, many neural nets operate somewhere in this abundant parameterization regime, which would suggest that pushing things to higher and higher degrees of over-parameterization may end up hurting you in some cases, which I think is an interesting prediction. Um, so let me just stop there. Yeah, thank you all so much for tuning in. Okay, um, thank you. What happened? We can all unmute. Are there uh, questions out there? I have a couple of questions, uh, but uh, I don't want. I want to let everybody ask. Uh, so uh, there's a potentially related uh, idea, which uh, maybe you can tell me if you if you think it's related, which I, I learned from uh, Andrea Montanari's papers, which is if one looks at uh, random feature models in, 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 in this infinite limit, infinite data, infinite parameters, and, and, and one asks, you know, just what kind of uh, functions can one fit, then, uh, you know, one can start by fitting, you know, every linear function in high dimensions, and uh, then the number of parameters you would need, of course, you know, goes with the dimension, and uh, then, you would say to, to fit a quadratic function, you would need you know d squared over two parameters, and until you get to that d squared over two, you actually can't fit the quadratics, and there's this kind of transition where you can fit them, and uh, then you would keep going. You would have a similar transition at every degree polynomial, and it's, it's sort of a reminiscent of, of you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure it's literally the, the, the phenomenon of the triple descent you're seeing, but it's certainly reminiscent. Do you, do you think there's a connection? Yeah, I think this is absolutely connected. And in fact, the reason that this analysis is tractable is precisely because in these asymptotics, all you can learn are linear functions. And we're exploiting that um, in some ways in, right. in order to, to make things possible. Right, so, um, so then so, so so there would be a multiple descent. Yeah, I mean, I think the structure of the loss curve, in fact, is going to be way more complicated than, than indicated here. Uh, especially when everything is finite and you you vary some width parameter and you transition between many many different scaling regimes, I would just say though that um, that that you can take this as a model and plug in your finite values for whatever problem you're actually studying, and I think get reasonable good approximation. I mean, uh, any of these asymptotic models, you know, it, there's. I mean, if you don't have good control over the convergence rates and whatnot, you, you're sort of just uh, in the dark when it comes to predicting the finite size effects. So it's, it's unclear, I think, in my mind at least, how uh, or when you, you expect these, these other scaling regimes to kick in. But yeah, certainly it would be, it would be great to have a, a concrete understanding of what happens when, when you're yeah, in this quadratic or, or, or higher order uh, situation, but yeah, that's sort of right. future work, I guess. Uh, there's a question from uh, Sadak Singh. Would you like to ask it, Sadak? Yes, yeah, sure. So thanks, Sadak. I'm wondering how universal is the double descent phenomenon? Like, is it uh, robust to changes of like activation, batch norm, optimization, hyperparameters, regularization, etc.? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, uh, I think I think the short answer is that it's resilient to activation function to the most part, so long as you don't become too linear. Um, but but it can be immediately broken by regularization. So I think I had some curves that showed what happens when you have L2 regularization. And indeed, um, you can eliminate the peak just by adding L2. And so here you see, as you go from blue to red, you're adding more uh, 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 re explicit regularization. And indeed, the peak goes away. And I think there's a lot of empirical work also showing you know, early stopping and, and other regularization methods kill this. Um, so yeah, no, I would say it's pretty fragile, in fact. Uh. Uh, okay. Yes. Thanks. Uh, so I, I had wanted to repeat the, the question during the uh, technical difficulty. So at, at the end of your previous segment, where you explained how the uh, the, the peak and the variance was sort of the uh, combination of uh, data or sam sampling noise and uh, initialization, you know, parameter noise. And I, I, w I wondered if one could even make a you know, less statistical statement of that sort, that there's some combinations of you know, specific sampling, specific parameterization, or regions in that joint space that's, that's leading to this divergence. Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't really know how to, how to answer that. In the context that we have these analytical models, you know, there's everything's isotropic. It's really hard to to identify pertinent directions or subspaces that matter. Um, I think one future direction that I'm interested in is moving beyond this identity covariance. And I think the tools that we're using, um, in contrast to some of the statistical physics methods, these tools from operator valued free probability do let you generalize things um, in that way. And um, in principle, you know, there, there are different, you could have a, a non-trivial spectrum for the data covariance and indeed have different directions that matter more or less. And, and my intuition would be, um, yeah, you, you could do some decomposition, which somehow is in the eigenspace and, 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 and attributed fluctuations in, in the different eigendirections. Uh, um, but, but yeah, no, at the moment I, and one, one thing that's nice about, I guess, this multivariate decomposition in general is it would allow you to it doesn't have to be three. It can be any number of variables, including all of the eigendirections you care about. For example, you could add and look at the relative contributions, et cetera. So I think it's an interesting question. Fortunately, I don't have any real insight. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll take uh, one last question. Well, I guess there are two questions here. So uh, yeah, I don't have to run myself. Question uh, from uh, Abdul Qadir Kanata. Uh, hello. Um, thank you for the talk. Sorry, sorry. I wanted to ask a question about the performances between abundant and superabundant phases. So what I, what I understand from your plot, it seems like in the abundant phase, performance is slightly better than the NTK regime case. So like, can, do you have like any intuition about the performance of future learning versus lazy learning? So I, I, like, it seems like, I don't know, like, just correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like abundant parameterization phase here corresponds to future learning and superabundant parameterization corresponds to lazy learning or something. So, do you have so it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, no, I don't have any insight into what happens with future learning. Um, um, I think this is just, this is, is, is extremely much more complicated. Um, with regard to whether abundant versus super abundant, you know, it distinguishes between future and lazy learning. No, um, um, I don't think that's the case at all. I think this is, I mean, basically just what you would expect from kernel regression with different numbers of, of random, random features, essentially. And so we've illustrated here that the abundant parameterization can attain the global minimum. And that's also, uh, we found in some empirical simulations. But I would say that um, the configurations for which that happens are, are probably uh, less frequent in practice than the configurations for which the global minimum is at infinity. Um, but, but again, this is sort of just this kind of toy model from this single hidden layer case. And I think in practice, the situation will be much more complicated. 
um, and whether or not the global minimum debt infinity is really a, a model dependent question, et cetera. And the main point, I guess, is just that, you know, there's non-trivial behavior that's happening out here in the deep over-parameterized regime, even in the lazy, lazy learning setting. Uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, question from uh, Vinath Nanda Kumar. Oh, hi. Um, just a quick question about applications to student teacher networks. Um, so, in particular, distillation. So, suppose we have a fixed teacher network and we want to learn it, and we're trying to decide on a good architecture for the student network. Um, does your work on triple descent and the, more generally the double descent, oh, well, um, do the double and triple descent phenomena have some implications for what kind of student network one should pick and whether increasing the depth of the student network will improve or um, adversely affect the generalization capability? Uh, right. Thanks. Yeah. So this is a, a great, great question. Um, so I should emphasize first of all that that the analysis is in this in these asymptotic limits. Um, and so the question about increasing the width is really a question about increasing the ratio of the width to some other large parameter. Um, and I think that's important because in the student teacher framework, which actually we do analyze, uh, although I didn't mention it here, um, the width of the teacher we assume to be going to infinity. And, and so there's really no, um, and there's, there's no dependence on the ratio between the student width and the teacher width. So, so it's not that you can tune the student width um, or depth for that matter to match the, the teacher and you'll get better performance or anything. Although that may end up being the case in finite, for finite size models, but in these asymptotics, it's not the case. Um, the thing that is oh. true. Hi, yeah, Eric, how are you? Are you? Um, sorry, so, uh, yeah, the no thing problem. is, the thing I, is I just actually is wasn't just you, was trying to make sure that I didn't miss you out, you know, like I was looking uh, at someone else, so, so, but yeah, good. Yeah, so I'm not going to take too much of your time. I just wanted to touch base. Uh, so, uh, hey, Mike, I think there's a way that this, this uh, uh, guy that I'm not sure where the noise is coming from, so I'm just going to wait. Uh, Okay, um, sounds like it's finished now. Yeah, so just my final thought on the question. Um, the thing that is true when comparing the student to the teacher that you can derive in these asymptotics, so we didn't include in, in the paper or anything, is that um, you can tune the nonlinearity of the student. And the question might be, what's the optimal nonlinearity to use in order to maximize generalization performance um, given some nonlinear teacher? And as you might expect, uh, the answer it turns out to be the nonlinearity should be the same uh, with an asterisk indicating same is, is, is within some equivalence class that's dictated by essentially a, a, two, a two parameter family um, that share basically the first and first, the second moment and the first moment of the derivative. Um, so if you match those two parameters with the teacher nonlinearity, then it turns out you get the optimal, optimal generalization performance. So, so that's one that's one thing that you can say. But with regard to the width and stuff, I don't think you, you get much insight in these asymptotics. Okay. Um, thanks for the detailed response. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll finish there. Let me just make one more advertisement for Jeffrey's work. He didn't have time to go into detail, but this operator value free probability, the techniques he uses to get this are also extremely interesting in their own right and could be applied to other problems. So uh, thanks again, Jeffrey, great talk. Uh, you can unmute and clap if you like. In any case, I'm clapping. And uh, thank you. Is Jeffrey's paper available on archive? The triple, triple descent is on archive. This variance paper will be there in a week or two. OK, great. OK. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so next week we will actually have uh, Marinka Zitnik back uh, on Wednesday to uh, finish the uh, talk that uh, she, you know, she didn't finish on October 7th with the uh, graph neural networks and applications. So I hope to see you all there. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. So long.